My last several videos have been bangers on the algorithm. That's cool, but let's tank it by doing something outside my niche. Here's a review of one of my favorite games, Risk of Rain 2. At its core, Risk of Rain 2 is a very simple game. Run through stages to find a boss, picking up item modifiers and killing enemies along the way. The fun comes from the game's 13.5 unique characters and their unique methods of interacting with this simple cycle. Sure, you can play a basic bitch like Commando, running around and shooting like it's Call of Duty, or you could full commit to new captain and just entirely ignore bosses by setting up an orbital strike. This game's Steam tags label it as a third person shooter, but that's not the case for every character. Some like Mercenary and Spider-Man have no ranged attacks. The point is, each and every character offers a different experience to progressing through the game. Different characters use items differently and get different levels of benefit from each item. This gets as simple as melee characters stack with melee items to as complicated as different characters having different odds of proccing on hit effects. The wiki can be your friend. What makes this game stick around is how it's set up for you to break it. Take Engineer, a character whose gimmick is setting up two turrets that copy your items. Maybe you'd think stacking off offensive items like Soldier Syringe to increase attack speed or some on-hit items is the best way to do this. It's not bad, but it leaves you vulnerable. So you come back next run with the much stronger Mushroom build, stacking 10 to 20 bustling fungus, healing you and your turrets for more than 10% health every one quarter of a second, stacking three times. With a few more healing synergy items, you can become God. The final boss can't even touch you. Unfortunately, this insanity is doomed to failure. Your item stack is almost always linear. Enemies are not. Hell, some items like teddy bears are logarithmic, meaning they realistically peak around 7 to 10 ish stacks and almost entirely around 20 ish. The game's difficulty is tied to a timer that is ticking as soon as you load up into the game. You want all items in a stage, but a full clear is extremely costly, especially with enemy spawns tied to time. Difficulty is tied to a funny number called the difficulty coefficient. That's calculated with the following equation. The specifics aren't too important, but understand that time escalates things quickly, and stage progression escalates things even quicker. So we have to move quickly and as optimally as possible, leaving some items behind and knowing how to abuse each character's optimized movement. But what are we moving to? The game has a variety of stages tied in a standard progression. There are stage 1 stages, stage 2 stages, stage 3 stages, and so on and so on. Bluntly, some are better than others, ranging from open fields, maze-like hellscapes, and absolute misery for low-movement characters. At least they all look excellent in this game's cel-shaded art style. Exploring the stages is interesting, but the real challenge comes from the game's many bosses. The bosses come in a variety of forms. Some like the Imp Overlord punish players for not having mobility, some like the Wandering Vagrant have simple patterns that you have to play around, and some like the Magma Worm have been f***ing off to a corner of the map, ruining my run since early access. The best characters in this game can handle these bosses without a second thought, letting you easily progress forward, sacrificing some items and build progress for much, much easier fights. Other characters have to follow a more nuanced approach, needing a bare minimum setup to easily handle bosses, forcing a player to more tightly path through a stage or take risky boss fights. Once you get to the fifth stage, you end up at a crossroads. This is a great time to mention the branching paths in this game. In the fifth stage alone, you can either move to the game's final boss, access a new portal to go to the new shrine, or go through the artifact portal and loop back to the beginning after a minor challenge fight. This game is just teeming with bosses and hidden content, but more on that in a bit. Going into the main path of the final boss, you'll enter the last stage of this game, Commencement. It features the player going around and charging a variety of beacons with different gimmicks, all to end up fighting the final boss, Mythrix. From a challenge and game design perspective, the final stage is very unique. It functions as a build check that will find holes in your strategy and then punish you for them. No movement? Well, get ready to spend way too long just moving through the stage and then having that timer charge up the final boss. No healing? Well, the pillars of blood will just kill you and make you run miserable. No, anything? Well, the other pillars will run you down. Plus, we got the Wisp Chimera that punishes not having flat damage reduction or healing. The final boss fight itself serves as a very straightforward challenge to how strong your strategy is or how fast your run can be. After a certain amount of time, minor mistakes become fatal, making it much harder to beat him. I love this boss, but he really is just kind of goofy. Sometimes he'll just get distracted and charge at your drones for the entire fight. 
probably his most notorious attack is his idiot ground check wave that'll just kill you. But, but my favorite part of this boss is his massive rotating wall attack that canonically is called Big Spinny. And it'll also just kill you if you're bad. Mithrix is just a fun boss fight. He's got very unique strategies for fighting from each of the cast of characters. From Mercenary and Spider-Man's rapid up close dodging, to Artificers and Captain's cowardly camping, to even multi teen Huntress and Rex, straightforward gun him down angle. It really rewards players for knowing their characters. The final level is a fun easy goal to progress towards that rewards a player for understanding the game. Textbook 10 out of 10 game design. I don't think the final stage is always perfect at what it's trying to do, but for me I really love noticing what the game devs try to communicate to the player with their design, and they really did a great job with the stage. It's also worth noting that the progression in this game is also well done. I, I know, I know, it's super common for roguelike games to do this, but it's done to a gold standard in Risk of Rain 2. Each character pushes the player further with their runs through the game. The Trickster, multi t and Commando have unlocks just tied to playing the game. Artificer, Rex, and Acrid all have their unlocks tied to discovering secrets along the way. And lastly, Captain and Mercenary just have unlocks tied to beating the game in various ways. It's the same with the many achievements which lock items and equipment, albeit these tend to have a much larger focus on secrets and exploration. I will say that some of the character ability unlocks can be a bit rough. They have the largest proportion of meme requirements. The unlock for Captain's Nuke requires you to kill the final boss by dropping your supply beacons on him. You get two tries to do this a run, or you have to restart. Even on the lowest difficulty drizzle, this is still really obnoxious and stress inducing. Then after that, we have the notorious mercenary ethereal achievement. This requires you to do a no hit damage on a random daily mode stage. I mean, from a design perspective, it makes sense. This rewards the player for trying a new game mode, it teaches about wacky shield builds and what actually counts as damage, and it rewards the player for understanding the mercenary's kit. Which is like if Master Yi and Yasuo had a baby. There's not a better way to describe the character, trust me. In practice, the achievement is more frustrating than it should be. And honestly, it's kind of hard to do on your own. Planning out a route is interesting, but it never really jived with how flexible I like to play the game. Shoutouts to the YouTuber Cabbage, who exists on YouTube to do this challenge on each random daily stage. Unrelated to character achievements, to the crab achievement. Overall, it's just that type of solid player progression that helps make Risk of Rain 2 such a good game. Adding even more depth to the game, we have all the hidden objectives and bosses throughout each run. These secrets enable most of the true cheese you're able to do. The most basic example is the Newt Shop, where if you hit one of these shrines before the end of a level, you'll be able to teleport to the shop where you can spend lunar coins to buy special lunar items or choose which stage to go to next. This is useful for looping, meaning if we don't want to fight the final boss, we can set the game to go back to an earlier stage, thus resetting the progress to the final boss and looping our run. Any other realm outside the ordinary will also loop, but this is important for doing an alternative win condition like obliteration, where if you get to 9 different stages, you'll be able to just end a run and clear with a unique win condition. This is all very cool, but the true use of the newt shop comes from a secret portal hidden in the back. If you jump off behind the spawn platform, you'll find a tunnel leading to a portal. This portal takes you to the void fields, a realm where you take damage for being outside these portals. The realm has a unique challenge, where each portal you do will give you an escalating fight with creeps where they get progressively more and more items. But for each one you clear, you get to choose an item, ending in a choice of red item. This lets you actually choose your build at the cost of a potentially crazy challenge. The worst one I've had is Tesla Coils and Crit Attack Speed. For some players, this challenges all the Void Fields is, but for players with the DLC, this serves as an entrance to a whole new realm in its own final boss. I really recommend taking your friends to this, who don't have the DLC, and then watching the chaos. Outside of the Void Fields, there's also unique minor bosses, such as the Aurelian Knight, which can be found from the Golden Altar. He's got a fun fight that uses gold to charge pillars to let you damage him. Beating him unlocks a special drone that spawns during bosses and is very solid. It's just a fun side quest alongside the many others. Don't forget the other hidden bosses, like the Egg Guy, or Kajara and Rinald. Let's go back to how insanely a character's mechanics can impact each run in the game. Here's a fun section where I'm going to explain a common run with three of my favorite characters. 
The Captain is an interesting character. Most notably with this character, one of his unlockable utility moves is an orbital strike that one-shots a ton of bosses. Obviously it's crazy strong, but you have to line up enemies 20 seconds in advance. Outside of that, the Captain's two main attacks are very weak, and he can't really deal with creeps that well. So the best use of Captain is for supporting a team in multiplayer with his support beacons. These beacons perform a variety of functions, from creating a healing zone, to a zone that stuns enemies, to a free equipment refresh, to a free buy of any items in a stage. The catch is you can only pick two before you load into a game, and you can only use these a limited number of times per stage. However, if like me you're not on multiplayer since you have no friends, you have to take his kit and use it to warp the game to your advantage. We're going to turn this game into a speedrun. By using the hack, we can start getting items immediately. If we hit a shrine of chance, it's two free items. Plus, we can position the nuke to just take out the boss immediately without any time spent on the stage. The nuke is so abusable, in fact, that if we nuke ourselves, we can use the force it pushes us upwards to skip the entirety of the ending stage. This works due to the one-shot protection in the game. Just make sure not to accidentally take damage beforehand. Once we're at the final boss, we can just sit on top of the ramp and drop a healing beacon. From here, just take pot shots at the final boss and pray a nuke hits. The mercenary is the exact opposite of Captain, in the sense that he's less cheese-based and more skill-based. All three of his non-primary skills are movement options. His ult is Master Yi's, his utility is Yasuo's E, and his secondary moves you forward on the ground. Or you can use the alternate and get more hops. Basically, once you put it all together, you get stupid fast movement right out of the gate. Also, you can't be hit when alting, and all the other movement options make you impossible to hit if you time it right. However, you don't really do damage, and the enemies will start to one-shot you incredibly quickly. So yet again, speed's the name of the game. Run through the game taking bosses immediately, then use your movement to quickly get items through a level. You need precise timing to dodge the jellyfish's wave attack, you need quick thinking to run from stone golem's lasering, and you need to hope you took the vertical ult to even get close to the laser cube boss because he just runs away. Honestly, the best way to beat the game with the mercenary is to loop through the stages and ignore the final boss. However, that's the direction for cowards. Just get good and dodge every instant kill move Mithrix throws at you. For the easiest character in the game, we have Multi-T. I love him, but he's so straightforward. Multi-T's gimmick is being able to swap weapons or be able to use two weapons at the same time. I too like using this to go double melee and ride around bosses like a ferris wheel, but the real cheese is going double machine guns, since you have double damage and double on hit effects from the start. In other words, items get double the value. Combine this with the base damage reduction he gets and an easy movement option, and you have one of the best characters in the game. This character can either run through stages quickly by being able to melt early bosses, or you can set up by doing full clears. It doesn't matter. Small skill checks like using the dash to tank hits or getting close enough to melt enemies is a thing, but like you can just full tank enemies depending on the build. Here's me just face tanking the DLC's final boss. It's fun and great for doing achievements. I recommend using this character to carry your bad friends. Here's a tier list of what characters I find fun. Balance wise, all characters are cracked in their own abusable way, with only a few exceptions. Some just won't fit your playstyle, and because this game really rewards knowing your character, they will suffer in how you play them. My trickster is bad because I'm just not a fan of the character's gameplay. Alright, now that we've gotten the casual mode out of the way, let's ramp it up a bit and get into the insanity that we can find inside Eclipse mode. Eclipse mode is this game's new game plus. Adding in a stacking difficulty modifier eats a secret run and forcing you to always fight the final boss. I've been lying to you about how this game's meta works. Itemizing correctly and doing full builds is a key part to this game's meta, and we're gonna have to use these items correctly in order to progress in this difficulty. This means we will often be full clearing stages in order to get correct items. Item synergies are also extremely important. I'm not gonna explain much into this, but for some general synergies, you're gonna want to abuse items that can multiply damage exponentially, abuse synergistic items like explosions and ignite, or just spam stack bleed. Not only will you need to correctly stack damage, but you'll also need movement, and a varying amount of healing and damage reduction depending on the modifier. 
That early example of an aggressive engineer build can work better than mushroom spam if we set up the items correctly and balance out our items. And it'll have to, because healing is practically disabled on the 8th tier of Eclipse. I say stack movement, because the real secret to being good at this game is just to not get hit, so you'll need to just stack the items you need as best you can. You'll get the hang of it. Learn to use the item recyclers and the 3D printers to optimize your builds. Even getting a mid item is better than having a bad item. If you really care about getting insane, check out Dispute Origins channel. They're a lot better than me at playing the harder difficulties. The soundtrack to Risk of Rain is very good. There are two parts to the soundtrack, one for the DLC and its game modes, and one for the base game. Both are very good, but they do have some differences. The first soundtrack is 10 out of 10 in game, but honestly only about an 8 out of 10 listening outside of it. This is because the game's soundtrack is designed to be roughly timed to typical player progression through the stage. This means a long build-up period and then amazing crescendos. There's just something unreplicatable about having the music peak during the insane moments of your run. If you want a taste of the soundtrack, I'd recommend the songs The Rain Formerly Known as Purple and Con Lintitude Potteressa. Obvious choices, but I recommend them nevertheless. Survivors of the Void is my favorite of the two soundtracks. There's a lot more menace to it and more variety. While the base game soundtrack is amazing, Survivors of the Void takes a lot more risky swings and instrumentation, and in my opinion hits them all out of the park. My two favorite songs are A Boat Made from a Sheet of Newspaper, and of course The Face of the Deep. The Face of the Deep is one of the best boss themes of recent years, combining a powerful prog rock guitar riff with an overwhelming jazz fusion saxophone solo. The soundtrack as a whole does quite a lot to drive this game and build its identity. Even if you don't read this game's very in-depth lore, you'll immediately understand the tone of what's going on when you hear the music. One of this game's biggest quotes is, and his music was electric. And you will hear why when playing this game. Risk of Rain 2 is a great game, only held back by the fact that I can never get my IRL friends to play with me. I am a sucker for great character-based games, and Risk of Rain 2 is one of the best. It lures you in on the premise of encouraging you to break it, then left hooks you with character optimization and fun movement. This game gets a very high 9 out of 10 from me. It got more than 200 hours of my playtime. The game's only $25, and you don't need the DLC at all, even though I really like the two DLC characters. Just a good time overall, and a great pickup if you like action-oriented games. I think that's about all I have to say for Risk of Rain 2. Hopefully, the next game review won't take 9 months. If you do want more, I recommend you watch my Toho 1 review. That video is gold. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.